Hello there. Um, this is Gramster After Nexions, and um, I'm back with my new stream. So today is the day when I'm returning with the uh, um, GM Nexions bootcamp. So that's a special show I invented some time ago that is meant to deliver some kind of uh, uh, learning stream for every viewer. So today it marks number 18. Um, and originally I intended to do this once a week. <laughs> Not always it happens, but I mean today is the day and I'm ready to do this. So uh, today's topic is what I call it the so-called the long squeeze. So what is the long squeeze? Um, yeah, so I'm a professional chess player, those of you who don't know me so well. I've been playing at a competitive level uh, for well, slightly less than 10 years because I started quite late. And I've came to notice uh, after some time that uh, there is um, a breaking point for every single player. So this is essentially what we are going to talk about today. So what is this breaking point? Um, when your opponent is playing well, really well, and uh, he just won't give it up. I think every single player, I mean, not perhaps every single game, but every single player at some point has a breaking point. And there are players who break easily after 20 moves. There are players who break easily after 30, 40, 50 moves. Some people uh, start mistakes in the 4th or 5th hour after 70 moves. Some people need to have 150 moves to be brought down. So today I intend to uh, show you some samples. Hi, Masiha. And uh, about some of my practices, how I was playing such long games and what was required to beat certain opponents and perhaps uh, some suggested strategies that you could try to employ in your own games. Right, um, I'll start with the first example and I'll try to explain perhaps the first thoughts that I would be thinking about in this particular position. So let me just uh, bring it up. All right, just a second, should be right now all right so of course we're playing with lag um this is my game again i mean these games are going to be my games <laughs> yeah so the reason is very simple there's nothing easier than showing your own games yeah probably every chess coach will agree because we know them so well yeah, thank you toger hot hey toger how is your day thank you thank you uh, don't overuse it. It's only five. Oh, no, don't do it. Five hydrates in one stream. You already spent four. Five. No, four. Whew. Okay. Yeah, I need to be hydrated. I know that. I know that. Yeah. Do I look so tired? Yeah, it was a long day. <laughs> anyway, so we're having this position with black. And um, yeah, it's my game. I was playing it uh, last year in uh, Las Vegas National Open. Uh, during my uh, uh, chess tour in the United States. And I was playing in um, seventh round, I think, against a um, talented American young player, Arthur Guo, um, who has the same name as I do. Yeah, so the topic is the long squeeze, how to squeeze an advantage or the win from very dry positions. So... I just want to show you some of the techniques that I employ myself and why never make too early draws. So for example, this position. So queen c6, the obvious threat is takes knight x and g2 and queen e4 and <laughs> 17, love it. Yeah. <laughs> squeezed by me I mean no 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 that's not the point I mean the point is you're in the correct place but not for the correct reason yeah I just want to show you something that you can try to employ your own games all right so queen of three and now the question is white is obviously worse 
I mean, we cannot argue about that. Um, but we still cannot really crash through. And uh, I think if White is quite an experienced player, he will do everything in his power not to help Black. So speaking about some of the achievements we've made in this position is we have a beautiful knight here on a four, which is strengthened by even more beautiful bishop on g5. We have some weaknesses that we can try to exploit. Oh, what is this weird color? Okay, here we go. On d4 and uh, maybe some rook e6, rook f6 ideas. But anyway, it always comes down to a simple point. How do we break through? Because without a proper breakthrough, you have just a pretty knight on the four and that's it. So when we are thinking about some pawn breakthroughs, so it becomes obvious it's not going to be d5. So g6, f5 might be possible. Yeah, but then this bishop is going to open. Not to mention that white might think about some bishop c1, bishop takes on f4 to eliminate this knight. All right. So we might think also about the possibility to do something at the queen side. So something like either b5 or b6, try to open the b file. But still, I mean, is it so difficult for white to defend this pawn on b3? Probably not. Uh, and the pawn on a6 is also becoming weak. So essentially what we are looking here is we are in here for a long game. Ideally, I want to trade these bishops, right? If I can try to trade these bishops, I can open the position. I can maneuver here until my opponent just drops dead. And at the right time, I will have to make the breakthrough. So the first strategy that you can already learn from this example is don't rush. Don't rush. What to do when you have no idea to play... Uh, that's a too long question there. Maybe I'll answer this question in between of this stream. Yeah, I hope I'll, I'll try to bring you the answer. So we are trying slowly create some threats in this position, but most importantly, we are not rushing. So we are not rushing with b6, b5. We are not rushing with g6, f5. And what I've came to notice after... Uh, playing uh, at a pro level is that so difficult for opponents sit and do nothing. So my opponent was tr just trying to do that. Yeah, we are trying to squeeze. Yeah, we're trying to squeeze. So slowly improving the position, trying to create some threats. Uh, look at this first. Rook b8. Now this is one of my favorites. We are trying to create some threats which might be Phantom threats. So I play rook b8 with the idea. I have no uh, no reason to rush. I can play b6, b5 whenever I want, but I, a queen c7 doesn't matter. I mean, I just give my opponent a chance to make a mistake. By the way, that's also yet another point is when you have a dominate position, dominating position, but you see no clear way to break through and time is not of the essence, uh, you could try to give for your opponent a chance to make a mistake. No, I won't tell the story about the Rouses. I I'm already over that. Sorry, sorry, Midnight Fox. This is this is a history already. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't want to already talk about this again. It's a, just a sad story and uh, just let's just move on. Let's just move on. Let the man live in peace and, and just uh, let's just concentrate on something positive. Right. So we are trying to uh, wait for our opponent to make some mistakes. So now he is focused about, am I going to play b6, b5 or not? So this takes him valuable time. Rook a2, g6. Yet again, we are not rushing with b6, b5. My opponent has no real counterplay. So he is seeking, uh, try to do some pressure against the pawn on d6, rook d8 b4 so here we go this is yet another yet another example that many players don't know how to sit and wait so in this particular example when you're slowly uh playing and carefully executing your threats 
it's by human nature try to do something. My opponent is a young player from United States, Arthur Go. I played this game in uh, last year's uh, Las Vegas National Open. And the topic of today's um, uh, bootcamp is the long squeeze. Yeah, so I just want to show you some examples from my practice, from my games, how I treat uh, the best way to try to squeeze water out of stone in... Perhaps this is a playable position. There will be more dry positions where draw is seemingly inevitable, but you need to be smart. Uh, and definitely this is something that the engines are not going to tell you. Why I pushed on the G-pawn? Yeah, G-pawn I, I played G6 so that I can play King G7 and I'm threatening at some moment the 5. But the thing is, my opponent doesn't really understand at which moment I'm going to push a 5 and F not. So he needs to watch out for the B push. He needs to watch out for the F5 push. But the thing is, I'm not even... I'm not even gonna, going to do this right away. So b4 was a hasty move. And now after b4, suddenly I have some ideas to sacrifice an exchange for a pawn on c4. For example, the typical Alekhin's gun. Maybe not even Alekhin's guns, but just double the rooks on the c file, sacrifice on c4. However, if I'm going to do that, probably white in the right time will just play bishop d2, bishop f4, bishop f4. And I see no points of penetration. So we are slowly, gradually creating some, creating some threats. So here the threat is at some moment to play a 5. And again, in practical game, in my practice, I've noticed that it's so difficult for the defending side to understand which threats are real and which are illusory. Because right now he has no clue Am I really going to play 5 or not? So all of the threats for white seem the same. So he has to defend them. Okay, here he calculated that apparently 5 is not a threat. Knight e6 here. Let him think. We are not losing anything. We are threatening some cheapos with knight g5. He has to protect. Maneuver here and there. Here and there. Now the knight goes to g5. King h7, here, King h6. And these last moves already indicate that black is going to play f5. At least he's threatening to play f5. Something like rook g8, rook f8, f5. I'll tell you a small secret. I wasn't even sure yet at this moment. Right? I just play King h6. I just want to see. I just want to see what my opponent is going to do. And this is one of those small tricks you can always play when you are the dominating side when every single active movement from your opponent is gonna create more weaknesses something like b5 or c5 i mean these are very big committal moves so king h6 maybe i'm gonna play f5 maybe i'm not bishop c3 rook g8 here we go and this is the first moment <laughs> Again, like I said, I'm not sure is a 5 really working or not, but this is for my opponent to figure out. So he makes yet another small concession. F3, supposedly defending against a threat, which I was threatening. Well, I did not. So knight a6, I go back. So this is yet another weakness on g3. Now I have some ideas to play bishop g3 and knight f4. Yeah, this is bad, but sure, but this is a defending move, right? Queen f2, here. Queen h4 is impossible because of... Uh, I don't remember why it was impossible. I think it was rook h8, bishop g5, knight f4 something, and the h file opens. So bishop f1, here here. And notice that white is avoiding trading the dark square bishops. Uh, either king f1 or king h1. But the thing is, we are torturing the opponent. Yeah, thank you for the hydrate. Really appreciate it. And for the follow, guys. Rook d8. Here. Queen g5. We can slowly, gradually improve the position. Now, finally creating some threats. 
against the pawn on c4. So this is one weakness. This is the second weakness. Now, if the pawn was on f2, I would not be able to target this. The mental effect. I mean, this is this is horrible. Yeah, sure, it is it is horrible for white. But I've came to notice there, in every single game, when uh, the weaker side, he's supposed to defend passively for 20, 30, 40, 50 moves. It's so difficult. I mean, it's just sitting in your brain that you cannot do anything. And I would definitely suggest you to employ this when you're playing from the stronger side. I mean, don't rush. Okay, B5, again, let's go back. Do you see already these three moves of impatience? So the first move, number one, was here. We had this position, you remember, right? So this was move 31, B4. White wants to do something, but however, that's a weakness on C4. Is it obvious? No. So that's another uh, impatient move. The second one, impatience or scaring of the uh, being scared of some illusory threats is defending against f5 is f3 so white really wants to do something but it's not clear for him what to do and the and the third move is b5 again so difficult and uh, finally at the right time black simply prepares a thematic sacrifice on c4 which was all our all of our idea all along position the bishop g3 the knight on f4 by sacrificing on c4 rook c3 rook c2 knight h3 the king is in a checkmate mating uh, in a mating net again we are offering to trade the bishops by the way if white would agree who says we have to sacrifice on c4 we already managed to achieve some success from this position. So now rook c4 takes rook c2. Yeah, I mean, this was already necessary because bishop g3, knight f4 was incoming. And now you ask me, what was the best defense for white? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just sit and do nothing. But... I'll remind you what are the rules of the game of chess, at least according to International Chess Federation, is you can legally make 49 moves by not moving a pawn or making a single trade in the 50th move. <laughs> you push a pawn for one square forward, you trade something, I mean, either this or that, you continue to torture your opponent for 49 moves. In the 50th move, you push a pawn or make a trade and you continue playing for 49 and 50 moves. I mean, this is unbearable. Right, so uh, chess is, of course, a big game strategy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Pop Dragon, for the cheer. Appreciate it. So I'll show you yet another example. Yeah, the longest game. Actually, Togger, I checked this. Wait a second. Yeah, I, I checked this in the database for my games. Yeah, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Yeah, this is a, a game of patience. Because uh, when two skilled players are playing, uh, like I mentioned, none of them is going to break easily. And uh, at very often, something like at fourth or fifth hour, uh, what uh, comes into play is the fatigue and the energy levels you have concentration so like i said some people just don't break earlier than 17th uh, 17th move um, the longest game i've played myself is something like a classical game 160 moves something like this so that's definitely not in uh, not a record not a world record by by all means i think the record is something like uh i don't know 300 maybe moves right all right so let, let's go forward and um, I'll tell you, okay, this is yet another fine example. I played this game a long, long time ago against um, a Lithuanian international master, Mindaugus Beinoras. I was playing with White. Uh, Mindaugus is a talented international master from Lithuania. We were playing in a zonal tournament. 
Meditate. No, I, I don't know nothing about the meditate. <laughs> but definitely patience is a key, a uh, key part. And by the way, I I came to notice the older you become, the more you're playing, the less patience you have. It's quite funny actually, because I'll take maybe a more a uh, more famous example, like Magnus Carlsen. Do you remember how he was playing about five years ago? Five, seven years ago. He was a super dry player, super positional player. And he could torture his opponent until they just drop dead. Right? I mean, he's just moving here and there, here and there, and slowly maneuvering and bringing them into end games and and pushing them and pushing and pushing and they're breaking at some moment he was super good I, I think he's one of the best in the world I mean, he's world champion right so he should be one of the best in the world and i noticed that at some moment he just became slightly impatient yeah he started to play more dynamic chess taking more risks <laughs> i think that it simply comes with the age that yeah you become yeah i got squeezed myself i'm going to i'm going to show you that story yeah, I got squeezed. Yeah, it happens. It also happens to me. Uh, it's very, very unpleasant. I have I've had such experience. Right. So this game, again, I'm not going to talk too much about the opening phase. Seemingly, I got just a slightly better position here, here, and here. Rook B8. Uh, seemingly, it's nothing. Right. I mean, the queens are off the board. We have played. 19 moves, black just needs to trade a couple of pieces, yet I still play this game for 100 moves. So first I try to improve the position as much as I can, a4, try to gain some space, a5, here, not to trade a single piece, I want to keep them on the board, f4, try to gain more space, more space, more space, here, here. And here actually starts the maneuvering, because, again, I do believe in this principle that if you are playing it too quickly by trying to force too many things, you are not giving your opponent a chance to make a mistake. So maybe he also wants to play... <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Jakobsen, you're right. Uh, maybe he also wants to play actively. But here, every single move that Black is going to make, every single pawn push is just going to either open the position or create some targets. So all I need to do is just slowly, carefully improve the position and wait for perhaps um, a committal decision from my opponent. Because again, I'm not risking anything here. Any single opening of the position, like something like c5, is going to open this bishop on f3. Uh, f6, c5, just dream about it. This is impossible. Uh, what else? Right? What else? So black is just doomed to sit and wait. So we are waiting. I mean, if you would ask me, what is the purpose of rook d2? <laughs> what can I tell you? I don't know. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. Uh, no, I won't trade the knight. I want to keep the position as complex as possible for a simple reason that his position is slightly cramped. He is sitting on the last three ranks and there is a single rule that in a space advantage position you are interested to have as many pieces on the board as possible. And on the opposite, the defending side wants to trade them off. So we are waiting. And waiting. Okay, knight e5 is obviously not a trade because black would lose the knight on d6. Here, g4. More space. We are fighting for space. And uh, here we go. Here we go, guys. So this is the moment. So starting since the moment uh, of 19th move when we got the slightly better middle game. We are fighting for space advantage. Avoiding any trades. How to defend. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try to get I'll try. So we're trying to create some threats for up for our opponent to think about. So the knight on e5 is annoying. So how do you deal with this? Knight c4 just go away. So f6, 
93. And this is finally our very first target. Is Black lost? No, he's not lost. He's just worse. Slightly, slightly worse. Now let's concentrate, concentrate against uh, this pawn on e6. Here, here, g5. Threatening to play bishop g4. Finally, I have some targets. Yet another big committal move. So this, yet again, shows some impatience. You cannot do this. I mean, I think it would make more sense first to wait on bishop g4, then to play f5. But opponent is hurrying to build up a fortress. So he is already thinking about this. He has no illusions. Yeah, maybe. But then again, on the other side... It's, of course, difficult to criticize black, but what active plan do you suggest? Not so easy, right? Maybe knight f5. Knight f5, bishop g4, and g6. Try to do something like this. Yeah, but then again, I could take on f6, and this is yet another weakness. Not easy. So black played f5. Here, slowly fighting even more space, not rushing anything. Yeah, this bishop h5 is a provoking move. Try to provoke g6 so that I can go back, play h5, and take care of the h file. He didn't fell for it. Just improving the position. I think Karpov would, would approve. A move is like king g3. Slowly, gradually improving the position, making these uh, prophylactic moves. a6. Yep, black is building a fortress. Ah, here we go. Let's improve the king. Now the king goes... Finally, black played g6, h5. Now the king will go to the queen side. Because it's doing nothing at the uh, uh, queen side. He's going to the queen side because he's doing nothing at the king side. I'm not going to comment too much these moves. Because everything comes to the moment when white is going to push c4 d5 we are going to have to push c4 d5 because uh, without opening this position we cannot really hope to exploit that we have such a wonderful bishop in an end game where black has these pawns positioned on the color of your bishop so the question is when i'm gonna do it and you know what's the answer is when i want when I want. So I'm I'm seeking for the best possible moment when try to open this position. So Bishop apparently is standing <laughs> he is standing better on b3. Not in a hurry. Try to improve the position as much as I can. Again, lots of maneuvers. And you never know, just give your opponent this possibility to make a mistake. Maybe he'll do something. Maybe he'll try to change the character of the position. Maybe he'll try to seek some counterplay, some ridiculous counterplay with b6. You never know. If you are rushing with your decisions, you are not giving your opponent to make this mistake. Um, yet another strategy which is super, super important for playing in um, tournaments, which have an increment of, well, let's say, 30 seconds. Oh! Thank you, Eugene. Eugene Pedalstein for the raid. He was my competition in the Ultimate Sensei show. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. How was is, how is your stream? Yeah, right now I'm running um, my weekly bootcamp about the long squeeze, trying to explain something from the GM practice, how to torture the opponents until they drop dead. <laughs> I think I'm doing great. So this is the second example. Uh, thank you for the follow and uh, and the raid, of course. And I uh, hope you learned something from from this stream. All right. So uh, what did I what did I want to say? Yeah, I mean, you, you lost my thought there. Uh, yeah, so about the time management. Um, I've noticed that in practical games, uh, the, defending side, the, the defending side, by definition, is spending more time than the attacking side. 
So imagine we are playing a tournament something like 90 minutes plus 30 seconds per move. Right. So around move 40, we should be already playing on the increment. So imagine you are the dominating side, you're playing this position, you have something like half a minute on the clock. So what would be the right approach? Of course, not try to uh, play on the increment, try to, in the last ticking seconds, understand how I'm going to play C4, D5 and go into complications. You could easily maneuver your pieces here and there, legally make 49 moves, get the time you need, then just push the pawn and your opponent at the same time needs to understand every single move. Are you going to threaten with something real or not? So by definition, he is going to spend more time. The knight on e3. I don't want to put the knight on e3. I like my knight here on e5. It's targeting the pawn on g6. I just want to push c4 at the right time. After c4, the knight is going to be gone from d5 anyway. So which is essentially what I did. After a million moves, here and there, here and there, here and there, here and there, finally c4, finally knight c5, because I felt there's just no better moment to do this, and e5, finally. So this is the absolute best moment when to do this. Black is completely tied, and around here, I think he, he was already in Sukhtrang. Yeah, so knight c5 is threatening uh, with pawn grab on b7. So if the second best move is knight a8, I think it tells volumes about the position. So I guess it's still d5. A lot of pawn takes. The bishop on d5 is going to target this sad pawn on b7. So king c8, d5. And after some skirmishes, rook e5, very important move. After some tactics, black simply got outplayed. So I'm not going not gonna to continue with this uh, position. So it was around move 100 that white finally... No, not around. Exactly, move 100. When white finally made the breakthrough in the center, followed by swift knight c5 and d5. And we go back to the position since something like... When we had the same position... Yeah, here. This is move 43. 50 moves for forward, fast forward. Essentially, nothing changes. We are squeezing. We are trying to provoke some weaknesses. We are waiting for the best moment. We are trying to understand the absolute best placement of our pieces and figure the absolute best moment to make this breakthrough. Right. Okay. Let's move forward. So that was quite a long game. Um... Oh yeah, this is this is one of my favorites. Yeah, this is my favorite. Every single game I'm playing against another Latvian grandmaster, Norman Smizes, is my favorite. He's my favorite opponent here in Latvia. <laughs> Torturing him all the time. Right. So again, this is my game. And uh, we play this game for 127 moves. And uh the 50 move rule, yeah, of course there is such a rule, but make a pawn push forward or make a trade and you and the count starts again. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And that's the beauty of chess rules. Okay, the, the theory, I'm not going to talk too much. I tried to experiment something here. Apparently it didn't really work. F5, bishop f6, e5. And that's it. This is the position we are getting after move 15. Move 15. And I thought, ah, oh. I mean, I was wishing for something more because the position looks awfully equal. Maybe slightly better for white, but not much. Rook e1, here, here, bishop e4, quite a wonderful idea. <laughs> well, found there's a miniature, okay. So f takes is rook takes on d7. So bishop a4, here, here. Here. And rook b1. And again, seemingly we have a draw position. But. Black cannot really give up the b file. Rook b1, rook b1. Um, something like a6, rook b7. I have a feeling that black is going to lose a pawn here. So rook b8 is the logical move. Inviting to trade. <coughs> rook b4. So rook b4. 
takes a takes this pawn is still under attack and after rook a1 we are going to win a pawn and despite the fact that we have opposite color bishop end game with the rooks on the board white has some practical chance to win this so bishop c6 was played yeah bishop a7 so black cannot really take on a7 because the rook is under attack here takes takes bishop c5 takes here now black again seemingly is defending everything c6 bishop d4 the pawn on g7 is under attack now pawn on a3 is taboo because of king b4 takes and takes black loses something big time so what's left there is g6 so how do we progress here we play bishop e7 a7 push the pawns forward and again of course black wants to trade rooks right because if he trades rooks takes takes even with the move as c5 this should be quite an easy theoretical draw because the bishop is controlling all of those protected uh, not protected but passed pawns on the same diagonal and the king side should be easily defendable so we don't want to trade rooks here here keep the position as complex as possible the pawn is going forward here here and finally okay the long squeeze has not yet started yet <laughs> i mean this is just a positional game i'm just telling about trying to get something out of the position so we are trading a couple of pawns here and there here and there try to improve the position the pawn on h3 was weak and this is the long squeeze so the question is, how do we, how do we win this? How do we win this? Because the pawn on a6 is not moving, the bishop is standing there, and black can always position the rook behind. And I think uh, it's quite important that you should try to def uh, set yourself such a goal, is you never, ever offer a draw or agree to a draw from a position of strength so this is the position of strength so if you're asking me um in an actual game an honest opinion how this position should end i'll tell you honestly it's probably a draw i mean it seems like a draw because i i don't see any single easy way to push that pawn forward and this there's also this idea that black might think about some ideas to sacrifice the exchange in f2 at the right time and then push forward this pawn sacrifice the bishop for this pawn and most likely escape him with the draw but am i going to make this draw right now sure not i'm going to torture my opponent until i'm sure he knows how to defend and here we go here we go rook goes behind that was a slight mistake a lot of moves a lot of moves yeah now rook f6 actually is possible so this is quite funny so because of this king so far away we are happy to trade position the king somewhere here here and the pawn simply advances so the black king will not be in time to block it so the pawn is two steps closer to queen so this is already getting quite annoying and a lot of moves and all we need to do is bring the king closer to the queen side, try to somehow close the bishop standing here, put the king on c7 and b8, and just queen. I get a lot of moves, a lot of moves. Not sure really how to do it. And finally, at some moment, you can imagine uh, playing for so long black finally faltered yeah I, I think around here it's already lost so rook d1 king g2 king b8 here rook d6 rook d7 and i think rook b7 actually was win as well yeah not sure why why i didn't play it yeah now finally rook b7 which ends with I'm not, not going to talk too much about this, the remaining of this game, but which ends with a winning endgame. 
So again, um, what I'm suggesting here is always play out your position until then. Uh, I don't remember did he offer me a draw or not, but I would uh, decline anyway. Yeah, I think it was quite a nice game. And um, now, if you would ask the opponent, where did he make a mistake? Where was this perfect draw? I don't know. I really don't. So this position is probably... Wait a second. Yeah, this position probably is drawn. I, I believe so. It should be drawn anyway with the perfect defense. But it's so difficult to play this position. For Imagine we're playing this position 120... What is it? 27 moves. So that's, that's something like 6 hours. That's 6 hours of game time. And when you're sitting in defense for... Two, three, four, five, six hours, and your opponent is pushing and pushing. And imagine yourself, um, you are sitting constantly in time trouble starting since fourth hour. So two hours of time trouble. So yet again, that is why it's so difficult to hold this. And I checked my, um, my, my score in the long games. Those typical drawish positions that you can torture until your opponent's energy or yours energy drops uh, to, to minimum, I've scored about 75% uh, of the results. Yeah, so let's say if I would agree to draw and not, not to push these positions until the end, I would score just 50%. But by pushing these games over 100 moves, I win more games. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for, for, the, for the bet. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll tell you a couple of more examples. Oh, this is, this is a lovely example. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the perfect example for the long squeeze. Um, it's one of my best games, actually. <laughs> yeah, not some, Tronic, not some, many. Many players, many players. So really, physical preparation is important. And I'm going to show you, or maybe I'm not, I don't know, <laughs> I'll think about this. I was, I was once playing um, a game against, uh, what was it, 2016-17 in the uh, French Team Chess Championships. I was playing for my team San Quentin, and uh, I was playing on the first board at the time. And I had to play against very good players. So uh, I saw that I was not supposed to play, but I really wanted to play against Li Chao. So Li Chao is one of the leading uh, Chinese grandmasters. And I was so confident and cocky about my skills at the time. So that was 2016, 17. I was about 2,630 something. So I said to my captain, oh, listen, listen, give me the chance. Give me the chance. I want to play the guy. I want to play the guy. I just want to show him how it's done. Like he's, are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah, 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 I'm sure, I'm sure. So, okay, okay. So I, I said, okay, I'm ready to play black if necessary. Sure. <laughs> and uh, he was torturing me for something like six hours. I mean, I was sweating there. I was sweating there because it's so difficult to play from the defense. The entire game from black I had zero chance to win. I, mean, I was fighting like mad for the draw. And uh, in the end, it was quite a picturesque position. I'm sweating, I'm I'm just dead at the board. And I look at my opponent, and he is just sniffing this uh, some kind of a Chinese herbs, I don't know, in in a flask. <laughs> he's super fresh. Like he just he just sat there. I mean, I was so amazed, right? We we're just playing there the longest game of something like six hours. I'm dropping almost here at the at the table. And no energy. Yeah, some Chinese cups. I don't know. He's just sniffing them. He's just playing. I was so amazed. And I, I lost, of course. Yeah, he squeezed uh, the game. And uh, maybe maybe I could show it for you if I'll have the time. What style? Not a squeezing type. Because, like I said, with the age, you don't have the patience anymore. Yeah, I had so much more patience when I was younger. Not so much anymore. The best GM? Uh, in a classical game? Maybe, maybe Pavel Valyanov in the classical game is the best. Online, I've played Carlson as, as well. Okay, so this game, let's not do 
talk too much about the opening phase. No, the patience on chessboard. I disagree. I disagree. I know it's paradoxical, but I've came to notice that my patience in practical games has decreased. I'm looking for sharper uh, ways to play out. And funnily, I compare how Magnus Carlsen is playing. I noticed he is doing the same. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But that's what I noticed. That taking more risks. And uh, yeah, this game is against uh, Vidmantas Malashovskas. Uh, household name for Lithuanian chess. Strong grandmaster. He used to be almost 2600. Uh, now he is slightly less. We played it 2018. And I'll just show the position. Yeah, I tried to experiment something. And again... What you need to know is the background. So the background is this. It's an awful tournament for me. Yeah, I'm playing with black. Uh, Malachowski is with white. For me, it's awful. It's not going my way. So it's a zonal tournament. Um, I just lost a painful game with, I don't remember, maybe twice in a row, something like that. And I was one of the favorites. So I'm getting paired next round, which is, which is I don't know, sixth round, something like that, against Malachowski with black. So, if I want to do something in this tournament, I need to win, right? I need to create some problems. So, look at the position, which is arising very quickly. I'm like, oh my goodness, really? I mean, is this game going to end in something like 20 moves? Are we going to just shake hands and that's it? So, that no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to agree to draw in this position. <laughs> Even more trades. So this position, I won after exactly 80 moves. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. Rook D1 check first. Takes Rook C7. Rook D2. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Akash, I agree. So Rook D2, the position is about equal. I mean, it's not about equal, it's just dead equal, I think. So it's com completely symmetrical position, but black, he is slightly enjoying some space advantage. Yeah, I won this. I won this. <laughs> this is why I said this is one of my best games. So f5, f4 makes sense to fight for space here, here, e5, right. What do you mean it's not working? I don't understand. What do you mean with that? So e5, that's a temporary pawn sacrifice. And now the question is, <laughs> yeah. Now the question is, imagine yourself, you are playing with white. How do you play this for a draw? What is the easiest way? Because I mean, white did not hide his ambition after the opening. He is happy with the draw. And I understand that he understands. And he understands that I understand. But I'm not happy with that. I want to play. So how does white make a draw here? Easiest way. So he is thinking about his options. So could I play something like king e3? Bring the king to the center. But what about king e6? Black is going to play e4. b5, b4. a5, a4, a3. Aren't there some problems? So he is thinking also... Uh, yet again about the, these so-called illusory problems trying to find some which are actually not there okay so maybe not king e3 what else what if i play e3 yeah sure e3 but what happens after e4 king e2 king e6 can i even trade the rooks here are you sure because the black king is going to be so active here are you sure you can do this if, you, if I cannot really trade the rooks there, what I'm supposed to do there? Now I'm talking hypothetically from white's perspective. I cannot even activate my rook because the black rook is going to penetrate. Not so easy, right? Seemingly looks like um, a theoretically easy draw. So what do I do here? I think he had to. He had to take. Sit and watch. Ah, <laughs> Yeah, that's it and watch. 
I think I already showed in a couple of examples how exactly it works out. It's so difficult to sit and watch, especially when your opponent is pressing you, especially you know your opponent by reputation, he's gonna torture you for 200 moves. Yeah, sure, just sit, just sit and watch, right? It's against a human nature, uh, against a human nature, just sit and watch. Everybody wants to do something. <laughs> so what he did, he, he did exactly that, he did something. So he played e4. e4 is a slight mistake. So I think he had to try to activate the rook. Something like f takes, king e6, and I was thinking about rook d8. You need to have an active rook. So this is a basic principle. So this is what I will be thinking about. So something like rook c2, and I think you just play here. Rook a8, a5, and oh maybe maybe even actually give a check first check here and rook a8 a5 rook a7 i don't think that white is actually threatening uh, uh, uh risking here with anything so it looks it looks a good position so e4 was played by white and it is of decent logic right because when you're trying to make a draw you want to trade as many pawns as possible and his idea was very simple. So takes, takes, takes. Here, he probably thought that I'm going to try to keep this pawn on e4 at all costs and play something like rook e7. And now after rook d8, the difference is this is a very active rook and this is a very passive rook. So it's doing exactly nothing, staring at my own pawn. And because of this very active rook on d8, white should be easily making a draw here. So what he missed is that I can sacrifice this pawn back after king e6, check, a5. And now suddenly it's not so easy. Not so easy anymore because white made just one slight mistake how do you how do you play here because for black it's easy plan right i want to push a4 b5 b4 a3 takes takes rook c3 rook h3 a3 a3 that's that's a committal decision this might be a weakness something like rook c5 rook b5 rook b3 b3 i lost rook c3 or maybe the same rook b4 not easy. So what my opponent did, he played rook to check. Here. And king g4. More space. Here. Here. Now, king g4 might have been a possible move, but then again, after rook h5, the black king is very active, and now we have some first real threats. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about this... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Endgame masterpiece. So White decided to activate his king by effectively cutting it off and basing the defensive idea if the white if the black king is ever gonna penetrate the fifth rank, white has rookie five check. Yeah, Masika, exactly. So this is why there is a very slow game, a lot of maneuverings. Until finally, white faltered. How did how did I decide to play f5? Sure, sure, I'll I'll explain. And after b3, this was already a big committal decision. I instantly felt this is a mistake. Cannot be good. So white's idea was this: rook c3, b2, rook b3, with the idea that the king can never join here because the white pawn is pushing forward. But what he missed was this beautiful idea. Take here, here, and here. And that's it. So there is no defense against king h3, rook c3. h2, h1 is queening. So white has to take with the king. Rook c3 check. It's a classical uh, idea. Uh, diverting the defender from promoting the pawn and this is just a tactical win so with the pawn on f2 
and rook on e3, king on g2, rook e3, rook g, rook g3, rook e3. This is just easy to draw. Here, this position is winning. All right, I won the game. Not going to talk too much about this. Why did I play f5? You mean here, right? f5. Yeah, it's very simple. I want to bring my king to the center as quickly as possible. So king e6, I'm fighting for some central squares. So this is why I'm not playing f6. f6 is just something like f4, king f7, e4. So we're still fighting for space advantage. Right? So I'm like killing two birds or three birds at the same uh, with the same move. I'm fighting for space and bringing a king closer to the center as quickly as possible. So again, I think the first mistake here for white was this move e4 and i've came to notice that many players are uh, many good players they are not really making these uh, very big mistakes right away all of the big problems especially for gms they start with some annoyances so you first make a mistake small small mistake like this e4 small annoyance slightly weak pawn on a4 there's something and the second mistake comes after when you don't know how to properly make a draw, right? So here White understands, he is slightly worse, but this is already not an easy draw. So how do you draw this? Can you tell me an easy plan how to draw this with White? So he's thinking and burning the time, he's not understanding how to try to do this. And in the end, combined by yet another mistake, because mistakes, they do come in pairs. So this is already a known fact. So it came together with a, another mistake that after b4, rook h4, and b3, this is losing. Yeah. After instead of this, the only drawing move was rook c5. Rook c5, here, here, here. And but to be honest, it's not obvious to me. It's not obvious that this is a draw. I'll tell you honestly. I mean, king goes here. I am threatening with king h, king a2, rook b4, rook b2. Is this really a draw? I don't know. Because this pawn on g6 is well protected at the moment, so I would imagine white wants to play something like king h6 and try to push the pawn on h4, keep my rook busy, and if he drops this pawn, he's ready to give up this rook for the pawn on a4 and march forward with the a pawn. Okay, but that's a different topic, that's rook endgames. But we are talking about the long squeeze. Um, let me try to find you more examples. I have many, many of them. Yet another long squeeze, which did not really work out. Because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you're not trying, it never works. So this was yet another game, playing with black against an international master from Finland, uh, Mika Makiuro, quite experienced player. So I tried to get some game going here, did not really work, my opponent was playing super solid. And uh, yeah, so we just got this position, everything is traded, I think I was in trouble at some point, lost a pawn. And around here, my opponent started to make mistakes. Yeah, I think around e4. Yeah, e4 was a mistake. I lost a pawn. And after bishop b3, white realized it's high time to make a draw. So rook d7, take, here, here. And this position. So how do we win this? This actually has some resemblance to the um, uh, game of showing against Norman's Mises. And again, this pawn on a2 is not really going anywhere. Uh, this was against uh, Finnish international master Mike Makiuro a couple of years ago. So again, what we are trying to do is push forward the pawn as far as possible. And our plan is very simple. Again, try to position the rook on the first rank, try to promote, 
Maybe, if possible, again, we can try to employ the same idea, position the king on b1, put the rook on b2, and try to win this. However, again, most likely this is a draw because white has yet another pawn here in comparison to the game against Mises here at the king side. So I think my best ambition here <clears throat> when I'm playing this position is I'm aiming for in the best scenario endgame rook and bishop against the rook. So that is the dream, the dream position. And uh, because I realize this pawn most likely is going to fall, I mean, such a far advanced pawn on a2, and essentially the opponent will be required to make, uh, let's say after some play 40 moves, he's going to be playing essentially on the increment. So my task is try to get him to the time trouble, try to make him a lot of tough decisions, and maybe he is going to voluntarily go for this endgame with rook and bishop versus rook, which is a theoretical draw, but it's not so simple really. So a lot of moves, a lot of moves here and there. So a little progress. And finally, finally we have done this. We have got this position. So if I somehow manage to win this pawn on h5, I have some chances. But the thing is, it's not even possible. Try to squeeze, try to get something out of that position. In the end, it did not work and draw agreed on the 88th move. However, I mean, I could have agreed to a draw something like here, right? Because this position looks really drawish, especially with the opposite color bishops. But when I'm playing this position, my task is to avoid the trade of the rooks as quickly as possible. So actually, white could have tried to force this. Something like, what was it? Rook b7 first, and then bishop f4, and then rook b8. I think so, at least. And he instead rushed with bishop f4, threatening with rook b8. Rook f6. Oh, rook, no, rook f6 is king g8. It's not so simple. So again, this is one of those positions when the weaker side wants to force a draw, but it's not so easy to do it. Yeah, so he definitely wants to trade rooks, but easier said than done. Okay, let me try to find more examples. <laughs> okay, this, this is nice memories. So you wanted to... You wanted to show if I'm going to... If I've been squeezed myself, yeah, sure, I have been. Uh, this game, yeah, so this game was played in 2015. I was uh, visiting Australia for something like four weeks, uh, playing an Australasian Masters in the lovely city of Melbourne. And my opponent was one of the Australian youngsters and talents, Bobby Cheng. And uh, at the time, I mean, I didn't know him. <laughs> I didn't know what he's capable of. And definitely it wasn't written on his face that he likes to squeeze his opponents. So I thought I'm just the only one there. So we played out something. I got a good position, nothing to complain about. Somewhere I tricked him. Thought I'm gonna right now crush him. A lot of moves, lot of moves. There's a big struggle. Some mistakes. In the end, black is slightly better. Yeah, so uh, around this point, it should be quite apparent that white is worse. Because he has slightly worse bishop on g2. The knight on b2 is seemingly misplaced, although it can be activated to d3. So my ideal plan is to position this knight on h6 to d4. So around here I thought, okay, GG, probably I'm gonna get this guy. 
and slowly I'm gonna alt maneuver because at the time I was <laughs> quite confident about my squeezing uh, capabilities. So if I bishop f7, here, 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 slowly bringing the knight to h6 to d4. Carefully, carefully preparing everything. Yeah, around here. Yeah, actually that was quite a tricky move. I think he missed that. Around here I thought, okay, okay, it's not gonna work. Probably it's not gonna be, uh, not gonna be a victory in this game. Although I thought, okay, listen, I I need to like show that I'm I'm trying to do something here because I'm the GM here, right? <laughs> and uh, so this was move forty three. I mean, some knight h5 threats are there, so uh, I need to be careful about the pawn on g7. I thought because of this terrible bishop, I should be the one who is pushing for the win. So I thought, okay, I'm going to play c5, position knight to d4. Maybe if I can tra trade these knights, I can try to push through at the uh, queen side. So uh, this is what I did. And I was not sure how I'm going to proceed. So I played bishop a4, still playing for the win. And around here, I think I, I offered to draw. I, I don't remember, to be honest, because around some moment I offered him a draw, because bishop d1 is also a protective mode that my opponent might play knight h5. And uh, I'm still waiting for my opponent to make some mistakes, although probably a more careful move was a6. Then again, knight h5, king f8, and then only bishop d1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who is the boss? Yeah. So I played. I don't remember. Was it here? Or maybe I offered him a draw at some point. He declined. I was, what? Listen, I, I have the bear knight here. I'm the one who usually squeezes. You say no? Okay, let's play. I was playing and playing. And then I realized, actually, I'm worse. Probably worse. Because this bishop on h5, as good as it is, it's stuck. So how do I get it in the game? Because white is never risking to lose with such a bishop on the e3, knight on e3. And the king might actually try to get this bishop. Combined with some ideas, if white is going to position knight on d5, play a4, a5, and maybe a6. So the knight on d5 is threatening two ideas. Knight b6 and knight f6. I mean, assuming the bishop is gone somewhere. So wait a second, <laughs> how do I how do I actually draw this? So I was playing for a million moves. And at the, around this moment I realized, okay, this uh, this guy is also the squeezer. So bishop h1 is the only move. Both opponents are waiting for some mistakes and a5. Very tricky move. Uh what is threatening to play a6 with the same idea of knight e5 and sacrifice on b6 and push this pawn forward. So I have to take here. A lot more moves. Even more moves. And even more moves. And even more moves. <laughs> and finally, yeah, finally around here, st uh, st uh, things started to get really wild. So knight c3, I'm lost. So this is already a lost position. So he squeezed me uh, with this uh, moving and shuffling here and there. So where did I make a mistake? Um, oh, king e7 apparently is the only move here. <laughs> Weird, right? White is trying to advance here. And apparently king e7 is the only way to draw this for some reason. Yeah, bishop h5 is just a weird move. Because I did not expect this idea that the king is getting to a5, knight c3, knight a4. And yeah, and around here, I just wanted to cry. <laughs> I thought, what is this? Because typically I'm the one who is doing this. And now, now this is what he's doing to me. And uh, yeah, the best move here was actually, uh, what was it? Knight b7 check. Yeah, and the simple plan is king a, king a6, king a7. I thought that was winning. So king c7, king a6, here, knight c5, just take b6. And this is just a technical win. 
Listen, guys, just please keep the Rouse's jokes. <laughs> so really, so fed up of this topic. Thank you. So what happened there? That game suddenly turned very wild, and he didn't find a win. And I was winning at some point, which I missed. Then I missed his uh, his chances. And we are playing this position, so he queened. I think around here I again offered to draw. <laughs> he again declined. So here we go, yet another squeeze. He is not training the queens on e4 because this is a theoretical draw. So this is move 143. A lot of checks, lot of checks, lot of checks. Check, check, check. No queen trade, no nothing. Check, check, check. Finally the queen trade. But I was already so pissed at this moment. I, he offered me a draw and I declined. I declined. I thought I, I need to at least push for the win here. So of course this is an easy theoretical draw and after g4, bishop g4, finally we, we shook hands. So that was uh, probably the longest game I had to date. 168. Yeah, 168 moves. But definitely um, if you're following um, uh, the course of the game, you saw there were chances. There were chances. I mean, it was initially, this was um, a drawish position. So this is a drawish position. There is no way to penetrate. We're consistently playing and playing and seeking for chances. And at some moment, somebody is making a mistake. Yeah, they're tedious. But if you're going to agree to draw, you're never going to find it out. So that's what I'm saying. You have to try to create your opponent some practical problems. Even if you didn't get anything after the opening, even if you didn't get anything after the middle game, just have patience, just keep playing, no draw offers, and you're going to create the chances. And in this particular game, I had chances to win, my opponent had chances to win, there was a big psychological battle because I met the squeezer of my type, <laughs> and, and we finished the draw, so yeah. I mean, I was very emotional after the game, I remember that. I mean, he was very cool. For, for him it was super easy stuff, apparently, every day. All right, more. Okay, this is yet another example. How to squeeze. The long squeeze, so this is today's topic. Um, I play this game uh, five years ago against a good friend of mine. Vadim Dushkevich in Lepayos Rokada. It was a rapid tournament. And uh, we're good friends. So normally you'd expect I'd make a draw. But for some reason, I don't know, in that particular game, I didn't really want to draw because I was stronger. I am stronger. And I was playing with white. So I thought, okay, I mean, let's play. Let's play and see how it goes. So it's just, if it's a draw, it's a draw. No problem. So we played it. Played some Rosalino. Not going to talk too much about it. So it's uh, quite a positional struggle. Yeah, around here, I was super happy about the position. Because black has an eternal weakness on e5. About Lutzkans, that's a, that's a longer question. He is just uh, not playing chess anymore. He is working full-time. I, I am gonna... I, I can answer you that privately. G, W, A, T, S. So I, I keep pressing this. Pressing, pressing. But how to crash through? How to crash through? So my opponent is making no mistakes. Some trades here and there offered. No mistakes. Sitting solidly. Okay, finally, I need to do something, right? So one rook goes away. The queens. If we trade the queens, this is it, right? The queens are off the board. We shake hands. We go happily home. If draw is good for you, so this is what you're doing. If you still want to play, sure you want to keep queens on the board. Queen e1, here. Now, again... We're seeking for some possible ways of penetration, something like queen e3, queen g5. If you're never going to try, you're never going to find it out. Uh, potentially, I could have some chances in the endgame. 
because black has this terrible bishop on c7, I have a very good bishop on c3, but if the position is going to remain closed with the queens off the board, it's not going to be possible. So a lot more moves here and there, here and there, g4 seeking some targets. And finally we have some chances. So queen is very active on g4. So there might be some possibilities at the right time, should the queen not be on e8, I might play either queen d7 or, or queen c8. Trying to open the king. And this is the position. So how do we uh, penetrate this position? By the way, it's interesting, the engines say queen f6. I'm not so sure about that. Queen, queen f6, that's interesting. Queen f6 takes, takes, king g8, king g4, king f7, king g5. I mean, I do need to watch out from the b5, and the a pawn goes forward. But apparently, yeah, queen f6, apparently it works. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't notice this, actually. Because I need to watch out from this b5, but apparently if I'm going to take, I'm always going to be the first player to queen. So the point was, if I'm not sure about queen f6, I cannot do this. First, I hide the king. Seek for ways to penetrate black's uh, back rank. Already at this point, uh, my friend was quite unhappy. <laughs> I imagine that I'm torturing him. And I was uh, quite unfamous at the time for the long tortures. For just not accepting a draw. So I think I've managed to improve my position the best I could. So c3 to take control of the d4 square, maybe d4 at the right time. But this was a rapid game. And finally, around move 100, finally black made a mistake. He became, he missed, he missed this very tricky move, queen h3. So that's all I needed. Because queen d8 is met by queen e6, for example, queen d8. Ah, wait a second, there's also queen h6. Queen h6, queen h7, just take the spot. Right. So queen h3 is actually a double threat. Yeah, queen h6 and also queen c8. So he missed that. So this was a blunder. So queen d6 was a blunder. But if you would never try this, you would never find it out. So of course, queen g4 was a better move try to activate the queen, and I was planning about d4. And I don't think I'm ever risking here anything, because takes, 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 king goes to a3, the king is under checks, maybe I can take on b6, c6, some chances, some chances, although the engines say it's equal, still. And finally, after the penetration, we transform the position into a winning pawn endgame. So this is how the game ended at move 111. And again, again, every opponent, I believe, has some some breaking point. So for black, we're pushing this game, pushing and pushing and pushing for over 100 moves. So he made a mistake, the decisive mistake from a drawn end game. Where was it again? This queen d6. One inaccurate move. This is it. But again, on uh, to defend him, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to sit on the defensive for the entire game. And uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to mention is I've came to notice. This is, by the way, slightly a different topic, or maybe it's maybe it belongs here. Is that I've noticed that some players they sometimes feel they are not allowed to play for the win when from defending a longer game from a bad position they suddenly have some chances they suddenly agree to draw like let's imagine black was pushing this position i mean black was defending this position for the longest game white makes a mistake suddenly black is better not winning better white offers a draw black agrees why yeah, new, 
new camera? No, it's the same. The same camera. Why, why does he agree to draw? Because I was being tortured for the entire game. So draw is what I wanted, right? And I've noticed this is quite a psychological thing, quite a big psychological thing that uh, some people think that if I was suffering for such a uh, long part of the game or if I had such a terrible position after the opening, draw is the maximum I should be uh, uh, hoping for. So, yeah, just think about this. I mean, uh, I've uh, noticed that Actually, this is a perfect moment when, when you can try to play for the win because for the opponent, he also has to deal with these uh, uh, with the psychological moment that he was he was the one pushing for the win and now he has to switch to the defense. Recommend against the illusionary threats. Everybody has a problem. I don't know. I don't know. Every, every single... Um, uh, case is a different case um, just use a good time management don't make the decisions in the last seconds um, if you I think it's quite important by the way if you understand that your opponent is trying to squeeze you that he is seeking for you to make a mistake then you specifically program yourself not to fall into that if you understand that, but if you don't, then it's difficult. Okay, it's slightly different, difficult topic. Um, more examples, more examples, more examples. Okay, this was actually quite fun. Oh, by the way, I have quite a few Lithuanian players. Apparently, they they like to be squeezed. I don't know why. For some reason, I, I cannot explain. From the games I'm showing, three players are from Lithuania. That's a coincidence. <laughs> I had nothing against my Bralukas, so uh, the brother Lithuanian country. I love them. So this particular game again was played against one of the um, young Lithuanian talents, Paulus Potinavičius, who is now a grandmaster, by the way. Super, super young talent. I think he's now. What is it? 18, 19, something like that. He was actually playing the World Cup. Too cool? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the follow. Who was it? Uh, Feto Chiri. How was your day? Um, Share? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I played this game. And uh, the backstory about this game is that... And engage as well. Engage 30. Thank you, thank you. So this game I played after I had the most terrible flu in 2018 no no he is an he was an international master he was an international master at the time he is now grandmaster he's a young player right now 18 19 again i don't remember exactly his age and uh in 2018 in april i had caught a terrible flu a terrible flu i actually partly lost my uh, I mean, my one of my ears is still producing sounds from the flu. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the side effects, unfortunately. So that's what I'm I'm gonna have to live with that. Uh, so for my entire life. So it was quite a bad flu. I was just sitting one week in my bed, just laying completely cold out. And the second week, I was recovering. And right after that, I went to play in the Lithuanian league. So I was just. I just wanted to go what? I just wanted to play chess. Although I felt so badly. I mean, the flu was over. Physically, I felt so badly. And this is the background. This is the background of this game. So when I was playing, and apparently this is going to be a big squeeze game. <laughs> so not really the right moment to squeeze, right? When you're feeling physically exhausted and bad, but it is what it is, right? This opening is, I don't know, it's something. I improvised right there. <laughs> Because I was not in the mood for going a big uh, theoretical struggle. Again, this is a game against uh, uh, Paulus Poltinavich. So I was just trying to do something there. I mean, my my mind was completely somewhere else. I was playing a terrible game for most of the part. Nothing special. Not going to talk too much about it. 
and I felt terrible in something like first hour, two hours, almost wanted to vomit. Finally, I got this position. This position. So this is the position. Rook d8. And I'm thinking, right, so this is the third hour of the game. And listen, I'm starting to get better. I mean, I, I start to feel better. And I think, why would I actually want to make a draw at the moment when I'm feeling better? Because I was resisting the temptation to offer a draw before. I just wanted to offer a draw. I just wanted to offer a draw and just get home and sleep. But, I mean, I'm white. My team is expecting me to at least try it for the win. So how can I do this? So, okay, I just, I'll just play something. And finally, I get a position when I'm slightly better. At least, I imagine I am. And I thought, okay, I'm feeling better. And I want to, I want at least to have some minor practical chances in this game. So what do I do? So bishop c4 here is impossible. Because bishop c4 has a direct refutation. Knight c4, queen c4, and rook d1. This is the tactics you should be aware of. It's quite, quite, quite important. So rook c1 is the next move. Ah, uh, yeah, Sicilian player, this also can happen. So, how do we play? So, I'm looking at this position, and suddenly I realize there's some potential for squeeze. That I might actually play this game for longer than I was, longer than I was expecting this to play. And the only plan is rook c2. No, 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 not rook c2, not rook c2. I cannot, I cannot take this pawn on c4. I cannot, king g2 is going to be some queen c6 check. He can always go back, by the way, rook c8. So, if he feels I'm threatening bishop c4, he's just going to play rook c8. So, I need a plan. So, I was thinking about a4, a4, a5. And my idea was that if I'm going to play a4, knight a4, queen c4 takes and take with, uh, I don't know, with the rook or the bishop, I could try to somehow... Uh, squeeze something from this duo of bishop plus rook versus knight position somehow rook on the seventh track and try to get to these pawns so that was my idea but before executing this i thought listen it's not going to be enough so even if i play a4 queen c4 takes 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 how do i get to this pawn on f7 so i think i need some more targets so this is why i played h4 and this is a classic. It's a classic phantom threat. So h4. I am waiting for my opponent to play h5. So if he's going to play h5, I'm going to play a4. a5 is a very big committal decision for black to make because he needs to understand what is happening with rook b1, rook b5 and something. So most likely to keep things simple because he is willing to make a draw here. He is going to play knight a4. Takes, takes, and with these pawns on h5, g6, f7. Now, this might be a problem in the end game. So, he was smart. <laughs> he realized, I'm not up to no good. And he played, he played rook d6. Very smart move. So, I thought, listen, okay, so you didn't fall into this. So, what about bishop e2? I'm sort of still threatening to play h5, but again, like I told you, I have no clue. Am I threatening to play h5 or not? I just don't know. I mean, let him try to think about that. I just want to see his, his response first. I mean, I can always make a draw. I can always play a4 even if he's not going to play h5. So, I'm curious. The pawn on c4 again is not possible. Bishop c4 takes queen c4 rook d1 check so this is quite quite a cute tactic so you need to be careful so bishop e to h5 i thought oh listen excellent excellent so finally i have some targets a4 just like i thought knight a4 was played take here now there is a very active rook on the seventh rank these pawns are a uh, a potential target in the end game here we don't want to trade otherwise if we trade only black can play for the win with this pawn 
rook c6. And my plan was to push e4, f4, e5, e6, trade, and get to this pawn. And with a pawn on h7, this would not have been possible. I played rook c7 because I want to put the rook behind this pawn. So something like a5, rook a7, a4, and try to get to this plan of e6, pressure these pawns with my bishop. This pawn is not going anywhere. It's a protected past pawn, but it's not going anywhere. So this is why rook c6 here. Now black is offering to play rook c8, and this is a hidden draw offer. So rook c7, rook d7, rook c6, rook d8, draw. So in order if you want to play, g4 has to be played. Because h takes bishop g4, takes control of the d7 and c8 square. Here. Now we can always improve the king. Position the rook behind. Around here this was a, still a theoretical draw. Until... My opponent made a mistake. Yeah, I, I think it was move 40. He made a mistake. King g8 was an unfortunate move. And after bishop c6, threatening not only bishop a4, but also bishop e8. Those are targets, remember. So here, suddenly, rook a6, I win the pawn. Yeah, so this again is quite an interesting moment. So bishop h, bishop a4 takes, takes. This is a theoretical draw. But I first offer for my opponent to retreat with the knight so that I can keep the bishop on the board and keep the position as complex as possible. How to whisper to me? Just whisper in the Twitch. I think it's fairly simple. It's a simple player. So king g7 was a very smart defense here. Now rook e6, a temporary sacrifice. And we reach this position. Um, I realized I need to go for the same game with the E and F pawn against the F7 pawn. So I'm trading the H pawn. And it was quite interesting that I remember this still. I was playing this game and I think, oh, I have some minor chances in this game. I want a pawn. Of course, this is a theoretical draw. So, but does my opponent know to how to, how to play it? And he started to play very, very quickly, very, very quickly. And I, mean, <laughs> I remember still, I mean, what is this? This is a draw, right? This is a draw. And I'm sitting and, and smiling because I'm, I'm not sure exactly 100% what is the ideal setup here for black. I mean, I know this is a draw, but exactly the technique. How, how do you draw this? Because with the F and E pawn, this is the most difficult uh, setup uh, from the drawn endgames. This is, of course, still a draw. And I was sure. He doesn't know it for sure. So what I did, push forward the pawns, slowly, carefully, slowly, carefully, slowly, carefully, slowly, carefully. No, I'm not listening to music. Should I? Should I? F6 here and here yeah unfortunately king f5 here rook f7 doesn't work here e6 this would be a lovely idea and i almost went for this <laughs> yeah but unfortunately black equalizes i mean not equalizes but simply makes a draw rook a7 e7 actually wins but after e6 king g8 and after e7, rook e7, yeah. Takes and king f7. Unfortunately, this is a draw. So I thought I had already discovered a bicycle here again. <laughs> so I didn't know this particular endgame. So what I wanted to say here is that, again, it's completely legal to, pu uh, to push this position for 49 moves, even if you are sure that this is a theoretical draw you want to be sure if your opponent knows it how to draw this because you're not risking anything so i try to get from this side 
Finally, uh, in the beginning from the king side, didn't work. Then through the queen side, didn't work. Then back to the king side. Uh, finally, he made a mistake. Rook d8. So at move 95, black makes the decisive mistake. Is it obvious why it's a mistake? Um, when you have to choose between sacrificing knight and bishop? Ah, uh, Togger, I, I am afraid there is not such a simple rule. Uh, depends on the situation. Maybe if you would ask me what I would try, uh, what I would prefer to trade, bishop or knight. Actually, lately I have became more fan of the knights, because knights are more unpredictable. Uh, yeah. Push to the end, of course. I mean, everybody pushes it. Not only Magnus. I mean, every every professional who understands the, the, the purpose of this and that if you're going to push it until then, you're going to score more. And this is exactly what happened. So finally, Black made a mistake by playing a passive move. And after King f5, Black is lost. Here, e, uh, King h6 first, e6, and King g6. And we transfer to a theoretical, theoretical endgame. Rook h5 is a threat. King g8, f7, rook h8, we win the game. So black was very close to reach the move 50 by not having pushed forward the pawns because I fixed those pawns on f6 and tried to get first from the king side and the queen side and the queen side and finally he faltered. Right. Um, let me say if there's more examples. Oh, there's 184 moves. Yeah, I, I mean, I could show this, I could show this, but this is such an awful long game, 184 moves, not really the best move, uh, best game, that I'm not going to show it. Um... Let me find it. Okay, maybe this example, I mean, it's not exactly the best game. But you'll get the, you'll get the picture. Again, 100 something plus moves. And... Uh, what is my opening repertoire? I play a lot, a lot of things, mostly E4 with white, Sicilian, time out of and Dutch defense with black. All right, so this game, I was playing against uh, Rene Stern, German grandmaster. At least I think so, he's German. Uh, in 2017, German Bundesliga. I didn't get anything after the opening. Yeah, Dutch defense. I love Dutch defense. I was playing with white, Rene Stern was playing with black. Super solid player. I was rated 2620 something at the time, so I thought, I mean, I should just crush this guy, right? So he's only 2500 something. I mean, I'm white, I'm strong. Should be, should be better. And I got an excellent position after the opening with such a sad knight on b7. Yeah, this actually reminds me. I had one of my previous streams, I had such a nice topic about the sad knights on b7. You don't want to position your knights there. Oh, I see that evil conk. Good luck. Yeah, knights are always sad, especially on b7. Especially if there's a pawn on b4, right? I mean, what is this? Where the, Where is this knight going? I don't know. So anyway, so I got a good position. 
something I misplayed, maybe I played it too cheap. I was trying to follow in the footsteps of the famous game of uh, of the structure of Anatoly Karpov against Unziker, uh, where he positioned his bishop a7, remember, right? There was this famous game Karpov against Unziker. He had all of the heavy pieces at the a file, played bishop a7, and then just crushed his opponent at the kingside. Knight and bishop versus king, yeah, had it, sure. Also checkmated it. So, something happened here, and I misplayed it. I was seeking for some targets. Yeah, queen a7 wasn't really necessary. And around here, I realized this game is over. <laughs> I mean, it's both 39. So, I mean, what do I do here, right? So, there's no... There's no penetration squares, no nothing. I mean, how do I crash through? No g4, h4, g5, I mean, no e5. Normally, this is when you just shake hands. <laughs> but no, I want to play. Because he has this weakness on b5. Listen, I can try to, I can try to push. Finally, I played bishop g4. Force him to trade. And then we played another 50 moves. And even more. And even more. And even more. Waiting for something. Hoping for something. Waiting and waiting. And even traded a knight in the process. No, for the bishop. Even more moves. And even more moves. And even more. Try to push something. And push the pawn on G3. I can legally play even more 50 moves. <laughs> And finally, okay, okay, this is a draw, this is a draw. But listen, I mean, if you don't try it, you're never gonna get those results. So I'm showing you these res these games, these long squeezes, that I'm not winning all of them. So I would say every second game is a draw, and every second game is a win. I'm happy with those chances. Actually, this reminds me of this topic. I was um, I was some time ago, something like a couple of years ago. I I have a very good friend, uh, Igor Kovalenko, who is uh, number one Latvian player. And uh, I once uh, asked him, Igor, why are you doing this? Because he is constantly over pushing the positions, and uh, he's going for let's say uh, maybe not this position, but a similar position. And um, he's risking. Like, if I feel I'm risking to lose uh, by pushing too much, I won't play it. I won't play it. But he is. He is playing. And, and he's always risking and pushing to the limit and sometimes losing. And I've been at uh, those moments uh, beside him. I've seen him losing. And at those moments, I just ask him, why are you doing this? Why are you pushing this? <laughs> uh, you know what he said to me? I'm winning more. It's a simple, simple mathematics. I'm winning more. So that's it. So he realizes, right? So he over pushes, let's say, a slightly risky position when you, you think, if I continue to play, maybe I might risk to lose. But he said, I mean, if I'm going to play 10 games of this position or similar positions, I'm going to maybe draw five Okay, maybe f draw four games, maybe lose two, but I'm going to win four. So in the end, I'm scoring six, six out of nine or 60%. So if I'm going to agree all the time to a draw in this position where I'm thinking that I'm risking to lose, I'm going to score 50%. <laughs> so it's simple mathematics. I mean, he's right. He's right. Although, I mean... For me personally, it would be quite difficult to do this because I'm also quite careful. So if I see I'm actually really risking to lose this, I won't push it. But he is just gambler. Okay. No, it's not random. It's not random. Just using your chances until the end. Pushing to the limit. Um, this is a fun endgame. 
And this is a fun endgame. Um, this is show to you. I'm not sure. I showed you all of the best examples I had. Maybe, maybe I can show you this one. Oh, listen, no, listen, I could show you this game against Li Chao because I did promise to you. I mean, I didn't promise really, I mentioned this story about Li Chao I was playing in... Uh, what's his... What, what's his last name? Is it Li or Chao? I, I, I don't know it. I'm gonna find a game. Everybody feels awful when losing such positions. Everybody. As Mikhail Tal would say, every loss for him is a small death. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it does feel like that. Every loss is a small death. Okay. I'm gonna show you now this game. And this game I played, I slightly already mentioned this before. In, what was it? 2017 against Li Chao. Yeah, small death. Micro, micro death. Maybe I'm paraphrasing him. I mean, <laughs> when, when you play, you play and lose like that, you just want to quit chess. You just want to just not exist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those of you who take chess so personally, probably you understand. One cell, yeah, one cell dies. I like that. One cell inside you dies. One, uh, the nerve cell dies. Yeah, so it's quite difficult. You feel emotionally depressed. and uh, But okay, then comes the next day and you're feeling fine. So this game was against Li Chao. I just wanted to show this um, end game. I was playing with black, suffering, and I got this endgame. Not really fun to play. He let me out, gave me some chances. And we are getting to an endgame where I have opposite color bishops again and the rook. So if I somehow can manage to trade rooks, this is a draw end game. But I have problem that all of my pawns, and since I'm the defending side, there are positioned on the color of my opponent's bishop. But still, it's not easy to crash through. So normally this should be a draw. But the thing is, he's not offering a draw. I'm playing, he's not offering, I'm playing, he's not offering, he's playing. He's still playing, he's doing exactly what I would have done to my opponent. So white is carefully playing this out. I think he had no illusions that normally this would be a drawn endgame, but one thing is know how this game is going to end. The second, second thing is you have to show it, how to draw this. And pushing and pushing, you can see he is a perfect squeezer. Finally play g4, rook g4, because here you need to make a breakthrough, right? Without a breakthrough, you can do anything. I also missed over the board games, I so missed that. <laughs> for a week? Spain Aleph, you felt badly for a week? Wow. That must have been a very important game for you. Wow, one week. I mean, for me it's been that I want to quit chess. It's, I had a switch for maybe 50 times. <laughs> I just lose very important game. I just want to throw in the towel and that's it. I'm quitting chess. I just don't want to play this stupid game. And then comes the next day. I'm relaxed. I'm calm. And you realize that it's just a game. Yeah. So this is... 
This is what you can always try to remind you when you're losing a painful game. This is just a game. It's just a game. Yeah, but easier said than done, right? Yeah. So anyway, a tilt. Yeah, chess players are also tilting very badly, very badly. Actually, I was uh, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday I I was sitting there at work. I thought, listen. I, I just need to do something for a change. And I decided to play some Blitz. Listen, who who decided to accept my challenge? <laughs> Gotham Chess. Yeah, so I was just sitting there and just playing. And suddenly Gotham Chess joins my my game. <laughs> he said, hello there. How are you doing? I checked the Twitch. Yeah, he's streaming. He's streaming right there. My games. And uh, <laughs> I switched it off, obviously, because I didn't want to follow it. And I got super lucky. <laughs> Uh, he was, um, I mean, I was doing great in the first game. There were some tricks. I won the first game. I was getting crushed absolutely in the second game. I won it. Uh, somehow I tricked him. So obviously he was already upset. And we started the next game, the third game. And he mouse slipped. <laughs> the third move, the character e4, c6, d4, d5, e takes and c5. <laughs> well, I was thinking what to do. He resigned. Resigned and quit. <clears throat> then I switch on to his stream. He was like going mad. Just has such a big rant. How he's playing so badly. So definitely, definitely. Uh, very good players can go to tilt. Yeah. Completely normal. Pretty sure at the evening he was already. He had already forgotten that. So. Yeah, so finally right here. Play g4, rook g4, king b3 here. So this pawn on e4 is lost because f5, rook g5, this is a very big threat. My rook is misplaced, so I cannot defend against bishop e4. Maybe I should. I mean, maybe I should just give up this pawn on e4 and just sit and do nothing. But again, again, so this is the point. How can you, how can you sit and do nothing? So we are just built differently. We want to do something. So I decided to activate my rook, give up the pawn, and seek some activity, and seek some trades. So in the end, I'm going to show you this position, the critical moment, still a theoretical draw. Not sure really how to draw this. And finally, Check, check, here. Now I'm going to ask you this question. <clears throat> I've used this example for my students. Can you, can you answer it correctly? So, <laughs> take? Yeah, yeah, but okay. But no, listen, listen to my question. So I'm going to tell you the options. Option number one. You take the bishop on, uh, take with the bishop on d6. You steer the game into an endgame, rook and bishop versus rook. That's your first option. But you are agreeing to be tortured for 50 moves. Because that's his legal right, to play it for 50 moves. And he is going to play for 50 moves. You can be sure about that. The second is you don't take. You position the rook behind. He plays d7. You play something like bishop c7. You don't allow this pawn to be promoted. And somehow you make a draw. So what would you choose? Oh, yeah. I think I forgot to mention. You have one minute on the clock. And you've played six hours. No, maybe not six hours at this moment. Uh, five, five and a half maybe. So GWS thinks you have to take. Any other ideas? Uh, this is um, maybe take immediately. Yeah. Yeah. This is easy decision normally. But I think at a professional level, 
It's one of the most feared endgames. But now I'm talking about not a classical game. I'm talking about Blitz and Rapid. Because Rook and Bishop versus Rook, it is a draw. But it is such a classic torture endgame. It's such a classic that everybody hates it. I mean, everybody hates it from the defending side to hold this. And uh, even if you know the technique, your opponent just can move it and move it and move it and here and there and here and there and here, get and move it and here. And then from this side and from that side and trick, 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 trick. Ah. And in the end, you make the mistake. Even in bullet? I don't know. If, if there's no increment, then maybe not so much. I think it's something like 3 plus 2 or some rapid games. This is a nightmare. I can tell you this. So, why take? First, we do know that this is a theoretical draw. Second, you are still going to get tortured if you are allowed this pawn to be pushed on d7. So, I did not take this in the game. And I got such a mad response from my teammate and the friend Alois Esquenis, who unfortunately has passed away for two years now. And he said, Arthur, what are you doing? Do you know this is a theoretical draw? Yeah, yeah, I know it. Why didn't you go for this? I said, I don't know. I mean, I was afraid my opponent is going to torture me or something. But aren't you going to get tortured after d7? Yeah. Is after d7 this is a theoretical draw? No. So why didn't you take it? So I don't know. I didn't have the answer. Because after playing five and a half hours, after being uh, squeezed for five, five and a half hours, I just couldn't make the proper decision. So I didn't take it. Yeah, yeah, torture G. <laughs> torture GMs, right? So of course, of course you have to take it. And actually I remember this advice from this moment when I had some simple, uh, some other games and uh, similar uh, moments when you have to make a decision, just answer yourself. Do you know this is a draw or not? I mean, do you know it? Just go for it. And the same applies, for example, this notorious knight and bishop endgame. So I've seen even GMs avoiding knight and bishop endgames. So, but again, the question is, do you know how to checkmate it or not? You know? Then you go for it, right? <laughs> and this this is very easy stuff, actually. It's not really so difficult. I didn't play it, and of course, of course, my opponent, while sniffing his Chinese herbals, <laughs> which I mentioned to you before, yeah, he was super fresh. He was sitting there at the table. He had uh, something like a flask of Chinese stuff. He was sitting there like this. Six star, six star of the game. Super fresh. So I don't know, I want that stuff. I don't know what he was using there, but I want it. And uh, yeah, and then he found some some victory, of course. Some, some very nice idea how to try to promote the spawn. Essentially use the same idea I used against Tormund Smith as one of the examples that I did before. Yeah, that's it. And his idea was to use the rook as a shelter to play rook e7 and queen. Yeah, yeah, GWTS, there's a high chance. <laughs> that's, a, that's a super valid point. Even if he pushes the pawn on d7, even if I defend perfectly and he promotes, he is still going to do the second torture. Torture. <laughs> Rook and bishop. So again, the simplest choice was immediately give away the bishop. Just start count the moves. And I believe in a classical game, plus 30 seconds per move, this should be an easy draw. But again, sometimes in time pressure, when playing a longer game, it's difficult to make objective decisions. I mean, now, of course, I know it. Sure. Drinking cup of tea, I know what, what I should have done. But then, in a tournament situation, so tired after the long game, <laughs> not so easy right okay so this was the second example that some very good players have tried to squeeze me so it's not only that I'm the one who is trying to do this and skilled players are doing this all the time 
Okay, maybe one more example. One more example, or where is it? Where is it? Uh, yeah, but those are not so good. Good games. The pressure makes me play good moves. Okay. Yeah. How do you... How to spend your time? What do you think on chess studies? How to spend your time on chess studies? Hi, Mas Damer. How is your day? How are you doing in this lovely Friday evening? Uh, Togede, I didn't understand really your question. Uh, you are too, takes too long to move. Just make your decision faster. What can I say? I mean, it comes with practice, I imagine. Yeah, you'll have to try to find the perfect balance. Find a perfect balance between spending the time and playing quicker. I'm not sure I, I can tell you this. Uh, there's such a golden formula. I mean, it comes it comes with practice. So I've played in, in my career uh, dozens of thousands of chess games. So both online, both on, over the board. Uh, so comes comes with practice is there a way to practice it yeah practicing it <laughs> just find games to play and just practice it and try to learn from something uh, try to learn from those games you played and uh, make the right decisions <laughs> yeah lolly okay listen maybe i should play some blitz games I, I feel I already told you everything I wanted to tell because I have some more squeezing examples which I'm not going to show you because I don't think they're so good. I showed you the best I have. And uh, now I was talking so much about squeezing and, and all of this psychology stuff. I just want to play some games. What do you think? What do you think about this plan? Okay, let me let me play some games, challenge somebody. Um I guess I'll have to change the scene. Here we go. Okay. Oh, sorry, 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 so an arena an arena. Wait a second. How do I? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna play games. I just tried to remove this uh, chat command arena. Where is it? <laughs> I cannot find it. it. Shouldn't be there. There is no arena right now. There is no arena. Oh, here we go. Whew. No, <laughs> don't use the arena. Don't use the arena. There is no arena. It's just a lefty from, <laughs> from the previous stream. There is no arena. Okay, let me run some music in the background. <laughs> I was running arena last Saturday. I just forgot to remove it. Okay, let's have something running in the background. Let me play some games. If somebody is accept, that is. So of course, big thanks to Gotham Chess who donated me some rating points yesterday. Something like 15 points. I really appreciate it. 
Vitaly Bernatsky, he's a strong GM from Ukraine. Look at this, very aggressive. 9G7, G6. Yeah. Some people are playing for the win no matter the color. Could I play this? Yeah, I think I can. Slightly boring, but it'll do. Check, check to the queen. Four nights game? Sure. So we got some kind of a positional struggle. Exactly how I like it. be it look at this that's a weird move I, I think I have to open the position now or maybe not the quickest uh, way to raise chess ranking is study chess study chess my friend Solve puzzles, study chess. Um, what should I do here? I don't know. What I'm doing here even? Hello, Dr. Zwischenzug. I like your nickname, Zwischenzug. I am good. How is your day? Bishop. Bishop, that's an interesting move. Okay, what about f3? Do you like this move? I'm pretty sure he doesn't. Uh, let's take with the knight. I mean, he's doing something weird. Knight b8, bishop h4. What is he, do what is he doing there? And uh, let's take this guy. Aren't you from Germany? I thought you were from Germany. Okay. Ah, that was a stupid move. Knight of six. Yeah, yeah. No good. Bummer. Check to the pawn. He defends. Uh... Check to my queen. Yeah, somehow he tricked me there. I can try to ask that question, but I'm not sure if I'll have the time to answer it. Look at this maneuver, wow! Without playing c3, I love it. Yeah, trickster, trickster. Oh, knight g3, did I miss that? Knight g3, knight c3... Ah, let's hope not. I equalized? I don't think I was worse, actually. To equalize, you need to be worse. I and mean, of course there are people who are equalizing their positions, but I'm not among them. At least I would like to believe so. With the youngsters to the end game. That's my golden rule. And he agrees. Listen, then we're gonna torture you. I have legal rights.
Okay. Ah. Check. Yeah, that was slightly probably a mistake. Okay, I'm gonna offer a draw. Draw greed. <sighs> Not the best game, but over there. Oh, a lapin! This is what I love. <laughs> Night A3, what is this? What is this? Who plays Night A3? Night A3. Okay. One of your games? Maybe. Takes, takes. Okay, should be good. That's a mistake, I think. He missed knight d4. He had to be careful with h3. Knight e4, can I win this on the spot? Queen e7. Uh... Oh, let's just play it here. Oh, knight b5, I missed. This I missed, of course. Knight d4, knight d4, bishop d4. I think it still works, I think. Knight e4, queen e7, I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, probably it was winning, but... I wasn't sure. By the way, I've changed my nickname here on uh, chess.com. Not sure I've noticed it. Yeah, but might be might be difficult to win this. By the way, there's no rook d4 in the end. Bishop g7, king g7, rook d4 is queen d4. Yeah. I changed my username so that it's easier to find me. Because I had a different name, a gamer tag from some distant path, uh, past, so felt it's time to change it. Okay, let's defend the pawn. Maybe that wasn't a good idea. The bishop is definitely better there. Definitely. But I started to appreciate lately the knights. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of two bishop advantage. Always have been. But I came to appreciate the power of, of the knights as well. Yeah, how did you know that, by the way? Yeah, influence of Kovalenko, you're absolutely right. Rook c7. I need to... What do we need to do here? Oh, it's a bad position to be honest. Okay, let's... Yeah, King G8 so that I can play E6, otherwise this threat to take on F7... How accurate is the rating? 
Um, not so much. I mean, a blitz rating here on chess.com, it keeps changing all the time. Up and down, up and down. So, nobody really cares about it too much. Can I play... Okay, it's time to f simplify the position. Maybe 95 wasn't a good move, but uh, that's the best I've got. Yeah, I'm slightly worse. I'm low on time. King h4, g5 loses, by the way. Oh, what a third around! Look at this! What a blunder! Wow! Yeah, and this should be losing for some reason. Yeah, this is unfortunate because he was pressing and uh, and he missed that. What should I play here? I don't know. Okay, let's play Talon. Manolaras, apparently you chose to pay the monthly fee, not the monthly fee, but the yearly fee immediately. I think so. Favorite opening. Not sure I have. I like some openings, but to name one of them as favorite. Yearly fee with discount, yeah, also think so. Also think so. Long castle. Very aggressive, what can I say? And he wants to play G5 something, it makes sense, sure. Okay, take care. Have a great day. Okay, it's time to... Oh, I need to watch out from D5 as well. Okay, that's a problem, by the way. Maybe Queen of 3 something. Knight of one, knight g3. What about this plan? I should be okay. I don't think it's anything. Bishop g5, rook g4. Slightly risky. This is still a weakness. Oh, 
what a blunder. Ah! Rook h2, queen f3, I just blundered that. And he missed that. Wow. Wow. What an escape. I guess he just noticed it. Check to the queen. Uh, yeah, he's pushing. B5 was a strong move. Okay, let's go for the counter-attack, otherwise I don't think I'm gonna survive this. Uh, what I'm supposed to do here? Oh, oh, bummer. King d1, queen b1, mate. Yeah, good game. Well played. <clears throat> yeah, he's definitely trying to play aggressive. I mean, it's easy to miss something that you're not expecting. So he wasn't expecting me to blunder, so this is why it's so easy to miss it. That's... It's okay. It's not exactly a world championship match, is it? Okay, a5, I think I can afford it. b3? Although he is gonna take, 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 and the bishop is very active. Ah, but this position should be equal. Not draw, equal. Check to the rook. So that this rook feels misplaced. Those, mo uh, those moves are typically quite annoying. C4. What is this? Take on E1. C takes, C takes. Knight F6. G takes. Bishop F6. I stinks to be honest. So I guess I have to play ninety seven. Nine G five. What is it? So he wants to sacrifice here. Wait a second, this this is not right. So Queen H five as well. Queen H five is the second threat. Are you sure you can do all of this? Maybe he can. Maybe he indeed he can do this. I don't know if I can do this actually. Let me check it if this works or not. Take. I don't think it really works. I mean, this entire concept because King F2 was Rook D2 in the end. Mm. 
But it's interesting, I don't argue. What? What is this? Queen C6, okay, that's not necessary. Just play it safe. I guess I misplayed it. Check, okay. Ah, 96. Okay, resign, resign, resign. 96 missed. Second loss. Okay, let's try something else. Any chess books? Read Mark Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual. Read Jakob Argard's Grandmaster Preparation. If you want to be a Grandmaster. Study the classics. Okay. So he likes the knights. Okay. Okay. And goes for the hedgecock. No, but uh, the stone wall. That's a big move. Very big move. Take, take, here, here, here. Can I do this? I don't know. Try blindfold games. This is how you can try to improve calculation. Knight c4 is no good. Okay, let's try four. So this is a threat. At least it was. Hmm. 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 How do I properly play this out? Don't go for the simpler positions. Okay. 
Okay, so he tries to simplify, I'll go for the checkmate. So I'm thinking about some ideas, queen a5, queen b5. Need to get to this pawn, maybe queen of 5 knight e4, something. I should be better. I mean, I definitely feel I'm better. This pawn is going nowhere. Bishop c3. What is this? I mean. Um, I don't want to trade queens. How do I avoid this? How do I avoid this? Yeah, maybe I just have to take it here then. Or maybe I should have played a3 first and then... Yeah, I misplayed it. Should have played a3 first. Ooh. Ooh, oh, oh, ouchie, ouchie, What is this mess? A big tango. Simplify for whatever reason. Oh, bummer. Yeah, this says shouldn't have allowed. Did I blunder? Unbelievable. Checks, checks. Oh. I won? Oh my god. Oh. Such a bad game. Ugh. Yeah, but... Dirty flagger, but... I mean... <laughs> okay, I mean... I was already ac ready to accept the defeat, but... Eh. I don't like such games, to be honest. I don't like to win such like this. I don't enjoy it. Yeah, maybe I should just resign then. But who wants to resign? Everybody is fighting on until the last bullet, right? Not a good game. I could have, but do you think I should have? Could have and should have. It's not the same. Did I misplay something here? No bullets left. Yeah, I guess so.
Okay, I don't want to give it up. I had some idea of knight f5, h4, knight g3. Beautiful checkmate. But I'm um, not sure it even works. Okay, let's try it. Whatever. Who cares? Take, take. What? What? What is this? That's weird. Ah, oh, wait a second. He just takes a piece. Uh, what did I hallucinate there? Unbelievable, this. What did I hallucinate there? I mean, I was. I thought I have something. Well, I have something. What I sacrificed a piece for nothing. No, the point is, it just, it just didn't compute to me that knight g3 is a piece sacrifice. <laughs> for some reason. It just didn't, didn't compute. So, what can I say? Rook h3, queen h4 is no good. Ah. Okay, just resign, just resign. Yeah, that's for the previous game. Yeah, I'm GM and I didn't see it. And I didn't see it. Okay, final game, final game. I don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah, maybe karma it was, I don't know, maybe. I've played against Vitaly some over the board games, so I know him a little. I know he's always very ambitious, ambitiously playing for the win. Keep running. Okay, let's go for this classic idea. I think it was a four. So it's important to get rid of this knight as quickly as possible so that f4, f5 is not so dangerous <clears throat> so this is the so-called king's indian attack i wrote a database about this stuff What is this? That's a weak pawn there. I don't think I'm even worse. Maybe I'm better. No, no, no. I mean, this f4, f5 is a typical defensive resource. So that's why. Wait, what? That's a sacrifice, right? Okay, I'll take it. Free pawn. Yummy. Oh, ooh, oh, oh, so this is why he played b4, b5, to play rook b5. I mean, this is way over my head today. <laughs> way over my head. I don't see such stuff today. Yeah, rook b5, look at that. Look at that. Impressive, most impressive. I'll try to do something there, but objectively I think I'm worse now because of this weak pawn on c2 Or maybe it's about equal. Ah, who cares? Check, check is good 
That's a good strategy. Try to give as many checks as you can. One of them might be a mate. You never know. You never know. So just like that, he's just gonna take the spawn, right? Just like that. Just like that. I don't know what should I do here. Okay, I don't. I think I could play some Fisher attack. Not not a Fisher attack, but some typical Fisher sacrifice. Rook of six. I mean, he could play it. I could do it as well. Some G takes Queen H five. I'm pray there's a mate. I don't know. He won an immo immortal game like this. I can do it as well. He doesn't believe me. I think he's right. Probably. Take, take, check here. Wait. I don't know. Does it work? It probably doesn't. Oh, wait. I'm also getting mated there. Whoopsie daisy. Oh, yeah, I'm just getting mated. Queen c6. That's Fisher's attack gone wrong. So that's why you don't play it. Okay, I resign. Thank you. Um. <laughs> that is just some bad games. I feel it's... Uh... I mean, he's playing good. Really good. Did you see that? B5, B4 and Rook B5? What was that? I mean... I thought he played b4 to play b3. Apparently the idea was to play rook b5. Yeah, yeah. Alrighty, I mean... It was fun. I enjoyed my time. And... Uh, I hope you liked my bootcamp. And... Uh, to all great things come to an end. And so this stream also comes to an end. It It is finished. Uh, listen, 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 listen. I wanted to mention one little thing uh, before I say goodbye. Tomorrow I will have a very special event. I will be playing my next match in the Streamer Battle League. It's a special little closed tournament for streamers like me. And uh, in tomorrow's match, I'll be competing against hashtag chess, chess club. So if you like those girls from South Africa, the jokes, but they're funny actually, they're pretty. So tomorrow at 6 p.m. Latvian time, that's I think 5 p.m. Central European time. And that's I think it's 8 a.m. Pacific time. I will have this match here on chess.com. You can find more details at my club, which is here. I've posted the news. Is he good? Hashtag chess? Don't you know who is hashtag chess? They are two girls. Two nice girls from South Africa. And uh, they are streaming, doing some fun stuff. Not GMs. No, 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 no. I am I am the GM. I am the GM. <laughs> Let me check by the way what's happening there. I'm gonna switch it to the lobby and uh, let's check what's happening on Twitch. What's happening there? You can see a lot of people are streaming. Ha ah, hashtag chess by the way is there. Listen, they're there. Stole my son. Stole your son. My son Moonstars. And there was nothing I could do about it. I don't know, Polko, how you did that or how you let it happen. Goodness me. Goodness me. Goodness you. I'm Listen. Listen, we have to support her, right? You don't want to cause I don't know what's happening there. And John really, hey, hey, hey. So I'm going to raid uh, hashtag chess. Nice to have you back Hope you soon. are going to so say hello uh, from me. So good to see you. Please enjoy the evening. And... See you tomorrow, and please for, play for my team, not for hashtag, please play for, for my team. <laughs> so 
<laughs> okay, guys, take care. Uh, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Using the new emotes on a Friday.